So, hi everybody. Thank you so much for making the time this morning to hear about um, our wines. I really appreciate it. Um, we have loved working with Kindred and Woodbury. It's been a great experience. So, I just want to thank you all for your support um, and your interest. Um, and I say this quite personally because this is my family's winery in Germany. Um, I'm the 15th generation to be involved with the winery. My father and I own the estate currently. Um, I live here in the U.S. with my family, and I do most of the exporting um, out, of, out of Germany to primarily the U.S., but also the U.K. and some other countries in Europe. Um, my dad is uh, in Germany about half of the year, and then we have a winemaker and an, an, and an administrator. So we're, you know, we're very old, but we're quite small. And, um, you know, one of our, our goals of the, of the winery, um, not only to make great wine, but really just to, to pass this winery on to the next generation. So um, next slide, please. So we are, um, my good Richard Böcking is in Traventabach, which is a town in the Mosul region of Germany. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so there are 13 wine regions in Germany, and the Mosul is in the middle left, or west, I guess. What do you call it? So southwest, the green one. Does everybody see that? Yeah. And it's arguably the best wine region in Germany. Um, I don't think a lot of people, I mean, I think if you're from the Naha or the Pfalz, you probably argue with that, but pretty much this is where the top, top wines come from, um, from this country. There are a couple, a couple um, unique qualities about the Mosul. One is that it's primarily the Riesling grape, which you all probably know is, is a noble grape and is very, um, very acidic fruit. So the wines will not only have a fruity flavor, um, but also a nice uh, acid finish, which makes the Riesling a very interesting wine to drink. The two other characteristics of the Mosul that are really unique are the super steep slopes, and I'll show you some pictures of those coming up. Um, you know, a, a, along the, the Mosul River, which is very windy, the vineyards just come up on either side on these steep slopes. And so most of the vineyard work is done by hand. These hillsides are so steep, it's almost impossible for tractors to go up many of them. So that really produces a clean, um, and a very high quality of the grapes you pick because you're literally picking each one by hand. So let's go to the next slide. So here is the middle, here's the Mosul. And if you look kind of, let's see where we are, right, um, yeah, there we go. Trab and Trabach is our town. Um, so we're right in the middle Mosul, which again, arguably is the best part of the Mosul, which is the best part of German wine wine growing country. Um, Trab and Traba, our little town in the late 1800s, rivaled Bordeaux in wine trade um, revenues. It was a huge, huge wide wine trade town. Um, now it's kind of your classic German charming town with um, many, many, many family wineries in it. And you can see Berenkostel, which is right south of it. Can you see that? That's another, I mean, you probably know most of these, these quite famous German towns. Um, next, please. So I, you, you all probably know most of this, so I don't, I don't mean to be just really, you know, redundant here. Um, we produce 95% of what we, we produce are Rieslings. As you can tell, that's, you know, the primary grape of the Mosul. We do do 5% Pinot Noir, out of which we make our Riesling. Next, please. Next, please. So here's you know, our facts, facts and figures of the winery. If anybody has any questions, just ping me or holler, or you know, if I'm going on about something that you know about, then just tell me to stop or move on. So we've been making wine since 1624. We have a terrific young winemaker named Philip Buchheimer, and Philip has been making wine pretty much his whole life. He's a third-generation winemaker, um, and he's quite unique in that 
he really liked the outside work almost as much as he likes the cellar work. So as I mentioned, on the Mosul, most of the work is done by hand. Any picking, any canopy cutting, any tying up of the vines, any spraying that needs to be done, new plantings, trimming you know, between the rows, all of that is, is, is somebody on their two feet doing it. Um, and Philip likes to do that, and he also really loves to be in the cellar, so I think that's a, a nice um, combination. We have six hectares under cultivation, which is about four, uh, 14 to 15 acres. And we generally produce about 30,000 bottles a year. I say generally because obviously production depends on um, the vintage. Next, please. There it is. There's our town. So this is a Taba, our town. Um, and you can see the super steep slopes. This is, this is our Borkberg Vineyard. We're looking right, um, actually right, right at the winery. So you see the church um, kind of in the center of the page. And just to the left is a building, a very long building, and then it has a stone tower next to it. And that is our Ritaza, which stands for Knights Hall. And that is our winery, and it was built in 1300. Um, and we still use it today for our office and for cellaring. And once you get the image of our, um, our label from our bucking collection, you'll see, if you look closely, this, this label was painted by a famous German artist called Johannes von Bodmer in 1840. And he, pretty much the town looks the same today as it did when Bodmer painted his aqua tent. And that aqua tent is what we decided to use for um, our, our bucking line. How do you spell the artist's name? V O N B O D M E R. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, it's an aqua tint, which is a, a special kind of print that he did. And he actually, you know, um, Dan has, I sent him a book of all of Bodmer's prints, and they're really beautiful. So if you want to ask him to bring it in one day, if you're wanting to put that on the, on the, your table there, um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. He just did all these aqua tints of almost all these towns in Germany. Um, and actually our importer in New York, he didn't love our current label that we had had for the Bucking collection. And um, he said, can I give you an, an idea for a new label? And we said, of course. And he found this aqua tint on the internet, or maybe he knew Bodmer's work, I don't know. And then he just put that modern font on where it said Bucking and he emailed it to us and he's like, what do you think? And we're like, oh my gosh, we love it. Um, so it's kind of the old and the new, um, you know, the picture of the old painting and then the new being, um, you know, the new generation that's taken it over. And also we, the, the way that we produce our wines and sell them is we really, really stick to a dry, crisp Riesling, which is very different than many of the recent producers, which will try to do, you know, Schwetnese, Cabinets, and have a more higher residual sugar wine. But we've really, really tried to keep our wines alternatives to Sauvignon Blancs or to other dry wines. Here's the Riesling. It's made um, a cuvee of all of our different vineyards. Um, it has a little bit more residual sugar than our other um, wines, but it's by no means sweet at all. There's still the acidity that balances out the, the little bit of extra residual sugar. Next, please. Oh, sorry, in that one, the Bucking Riesling is by the glass by Cruz and Mears, Cruz and Mears in Michigan, I know, know for sure, and I think some others by the glass as well. Maybe, I don't know if Kristen can speak to that or Chuck. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, Cruising Mirror has, has, has been, been has by the glass and by the glass and more and more and more coming along, along, along recently. recently. And, and you know, Blanc as well. Holy echo, Chuck. So if you go to the next slide, please. So our Pinot Blanc has really been a runaway bestseller in the past year or so. The Pinot Blanc comes from uh, neighboring vineyards. So we don't produce any of these grapes ourselves. This has been a great wine because it's a little bit unusual. It's a little bit trendy these days. And it's such a good wine. It's very sweet, tarty. Um, it has such just a unique flavor that when people drink it, they can't they can't quite place it, which I think makes it a little interesting. But it's not weird like an Albarino. It's 
Um, so I didn't mean to disparage your Spanish suppliers. Uh, so this one is great. I, you know, I, I recommend um, definitely offering this. The next one is our rosé. Next slide, please. Five percent of our production is um, is Pinot Noir, and we used to make a red wine out of it, which was delicious, but it was really hard to sell a German Pinot Noir. So um, we turned it into a rosé, and it's delicious. Our Philip, the winemaker, he um, ages about fifteen percent of it in um, these. German uh, oak barrels called Barriques, these super cute little barrels, and the rest in stainless steel. And then when it comes time to bottle, he'll mix the two together. So the wine actually has a really nice structure to it, in addition to kind of that juicy, juiciness quality of the Pinot Noir. Next, please. And are there any questions? Anyone have anything to say? Comments? No. Okay. The next one is our Devon Riesling. We make the most of this wine. Um, this is probably our best, um, our best, just straight up Riesling. This is um, a cuvee from all of our vineyards. The grapes are harvested a little bit early. It's called Devon Riesling from our um, 400 million year old Devonian slate that we talked about earlier. It's very crisp. It's very dry. Um, we just won an award in March from the Mundus Mini um, award ceremony or competition uh, in March. Um, and again, price-wise, this is a terrific um, bottle. Again, dry and crisp. Next one, please. So right now we're going to go through our four Grand Cru. I think I had four up here. Our four Grand Cru vineyards. Um, and well, actually, we're, we're going to talk about three of them. Um, so we have our Ungsberg, our Schlossberg, and our Borkberg. And um, they're harvested a little bit later. Um, they're, again, not sweet. They're quite dry. And each of the different vineyards has a different um, flavor profile. The Ungsberg, which happens to be my favorite, um, is comes from a vineyard where all kinds of herbs and salves are grown up and down the vineyards. So, you know, as you probably know, the Romans have been growing great, had been growing grapes in Mosul in the Germany since for 2,000 years. But before that, the Celts were there. And the Celts actually planted all these herbs and salves. So in this vineyard today, you could go up and pick 27 different kinds, such as like oregano and chamomile and some krauts, like kreuter herbs, you, German herbs you haven't really heard of. There's mint, there's lavender, and it really has this incredible impact on the wine. It's very herbaceous, it's very herby. Um, and this one's also probably our driest of the three. Uh, oh, spontaneous fermentation, mostly old vines in this vineyard. Um, we age the wine in our, our, our German oak barrels. Next, please. Hey, Cece, real quick, yeah. will you explain a little bit about the Berg system? The Berg system? Well, the, you, you mentioned that they planted the Bergs, and what is the significance of the Berg in the name of Ungsberg, Schlossberg? Oh, it means mountain. Mountain? Mm -hmm. A Berg is a mountain. So, so the, the Schlossberg, Schloss means castle. Um, the Schlossberg is near a castle, and then the, the Borkberg, which is the next one, Bork also means castle, different kind of castle, but also means a castle, and that is right below the ruins of a castle. And the Ungsberg, Ungs is, doesn't mean anything, it's an old Celtic word. Um, it, no one knows what it means. So... That's, and it's interesting because the, the government actually named these in the 1800s years ago, and there's actually not a lot of rhyme or reason to it. Sorry, the story is not more exciting. <laughs> so um, the Schlossberg is our other Grand Cru vineyard. Again, everything we do is by hand, whether it's in the slopes or it's in the cellar, all these wines are made um, by spontaneous fermentation, whatever yeasts are in the cellar will start the fermentation of these wines. 
Um, the, again, these single vineyards, these Grand Cru's are harvested a bit later to really get the intensity of the grape but then the fermentation is stopped to make sure that the residual sugar doesn't get too high. Next one, please. Borkberg, our third Grand Cru, same, same deal. This one is a little more angular and a little more slaty than the other, the other two. Um, people really just have their own preference. The Schlossberg maybe has a little bit higher RS um, than the Borkberg, uh, but you know the acidity on the other other side of it really balances it out. All of these wines are super low in alcohol. Um, all of our Grand Cru's are about 10%, um, and our Devon Riesling is about 11%. And for a lot of people, that's that's very positive um, to be able to drink a lot and you know not have a, a thick head in the morning. The rosé also quite low. So let's go to the next one, please. So this was kind of hard. <laughs> I didn't quite know what to put on these slides because I feel like I kind of say the same things over and over again. But, you know, this is really, um, you know, what we believe we are. It's a, we're a family winery. We're very small. Our wines are produced so they're crisp and dry and balanced. Um, Everything we do we reproduce as naturally as possible. We are not organic. Um, we do have to spray from time to time if you know if there are heavy rains and our grapes start mildewing, otherwise we're sunk. Um, anything we do in the cellar is just very carefully, um, just carefully done. It's not super precious, but it's just it's just very naturally done. Um, we, I really consider ourselves, we're the antithesis of large manufactured conglomerate wines. If we do have to put a sulfide in our wines, which you do just to clean the, the wine, we'll put a tiny, tiny bit in, for example. Um, we're not dumping all kinds of nonsense into our wines. And the goal for it, as I said at the beginning of the call, is um, not only to make the best wines, but really just to be stewards of this for the next generation. Next, please. Okay, I'm not going to go over these concepts because I feel like I have, and you all can can read these. But are there any questions, or is there any? Um, does anyone have need any clarification or any sales tips? Cool. Well, I guess I did a good job. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, that was see, great. see, thank you. Yeah. Hey, just, you know, if anybody has a question, I think just text me or shoot me an email. You know, even if you're out in a sales call and they have a question, um, just text me and I'll be happy to um, to re to respond. Um, I, I think the key to selling these is really push the fact that, it, that we have dry, crisp Rieslings. And oftentimes when I tell people we're selling Rieslings, their eyes just glaze over and they're like, ugh, I don't like sweet wines. And once you can kind of just get them to take the, I just call it the leap of faith to try them, they're like, oh my gosh, I've never had wines like this before. So, you know, that would be sort of my tip um, for, for starting to, you know, when you introduce them to a new customer. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Sure, and thanks again. I really, really appreciate you all being on this call and, um, and, and selling our wines. We really, really, really appreciate it.